twisting it a bit, actually pivoting it into a whole new direction, I would begin with the quote, two things are infinite, the universe and the human intelligence. Well, this was this one was quite contrary to the flat earther society. As being of beings of planet A, we have evolved over years. It has taken us centuries, but we have metamorphed into mortals who have at least acquired the feat to indulge in the matters of cosmos. The IEEE Robotics and Automation Society at NCU resonates with you for how it feels to get stuck in these four walls where every seven hour equalizes to a single minute on Earth. Did you get the interstellar reference? And to curb you out of the misery, we have brought this webinar session to keep your neurons captivated for long. A very wholehearted welcome to the attendees of the session who are all thrilled and buckled up for the upcoming hour to learn more about the laws that guide us or in other words, the omnipotence, space, time, and gravity. I would take this opportunity to introduce the esteemed guest of honor who will be navigating us through all the complexities, Ms. Parul Janagal. Ms. Parul currently serves as a research scholar at the Department of Astronomy, Astrophysics, and Space Engineering at IIT Indore. Our speaker for today's event has pursued her bachelor's and master's in science concerning physics from Aysar Mohali. The young achiever has a series of accolades attached to her name. Parul Ma'am has been a scholarship holder which goes by the name she inspired throughout her education. She's also a GRF holder and has played a significant element in several scientific projects. Presently, her work deals with the study of compact objects and use the data from multiple new generation telescope for research purposes. So before we begin the presentation, it is a humble request to all the astrofanatics to post all the questions and queries in the chat box, and they will all be entertained by the speaker for our uh, for the day. So without a further ado, let's get ourselves submerged into the colossal proportions reasonable for our very own existence. Take over the virtual podium, ma'am. We are super excited and thrilled. This was Aditya Tripathi from the North Cap University. The question and answer segment would be organized by my co-moderator of the day, Vivian Sachdi. Hello, ma'am. How Hi, are you? Thank you? I am really thrilled. Hi, ma'am. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. Hi. And as I said, we are super excited. We hope for a very amazing session. And yes, ma'am, we are very much waiting for this. Yes, space, time, and gravity intrigues us. All so, all the best, ma'am. Thank you for the yes, so pleasure to have you. Uh, I'm I'm happy as well. Thank you. All right. So, hi everyone. I have been presented already. My name is Parul Janathan. I am a PhD student at IIT Indore. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank you, the NCU Robotics and Automation Society, for inviting me for this webinar. It's a real pleasure. Um, this talk will be on astronomy in general. Everything outside the Earth's atmosphere comes in the regime of astronomy, including but not limited to the past, present, and future of every object in the universe. Therefore, it's a wide, wide view. Now, when people think of astronomy, they think of popular science topics, such as black holes, wormholes, space-time travel, hyperspace, aliens, etc. And some of us even think of uh, about the expansion of the universe, the big crunch, the big rip, and that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, I can't cover all of these topics over here due to some time constraint, but I'll still try to keep the talk interesting. While all of this is part of our research in astronomy, I think it is also very important to know the ladder that helped us uh, reach this level of intellectual and scientific thinking. We think that astronomy must have been one of the oldest even before the early human made fire and the wheel, the stars existed, and perhaps they noticed them. As you know, the sky changes, so many things happen. The planets go and come, the comets, the supernovae, etc., which would have probably made the early human wonder about the heavens above. Also, we know that they noticed because there are records of such things. For example, a supernova in the sky that was recorded by the Chinese called the guest star. Possibly, the related different astrophysical phenomena like eclipses, asteroids, etc., do things like death and calamity, or maybe a lucky charm, giving rise to astrology. But this also motivated a lot of early mathematics and science. In fact, most of the physics came out of questions that were asked about the sky. Soon, some of the humankind moved on from their fears and actually studied these astronomical phenomena. 
For example, Hippotus, who was considered as the greatest ancient astronomer, discovered that the Earth recesses around its axis. Eratosthenes, here was the first person to find out the circumference of the Earth remarkably accurately. I guess he was not a flat earther. This was about 2,000 years ago, maybe more. To keep it in perspective, most of the technology developed is barely 100 years old. Aryabhat, on the other hand, an Indian mathematician and astronomer almost 1,500 years ago, was a major early physicist. He also proposed the geocentric model of the solar system, where Earth is the center and everything else revolves around it in a certain fashion. Fast forward to about a thousand years to Nicholas Copernicus, who formulated a model of the solar system that placed the sun at the center rather than the earth. He was also considered as father of modern astronomy. Apart from being an astronomer, he was also a mathematician, a physician, classic scholar, a translator, a governor, a diplomat, and an economist. His book on the revolutions of celestial spheres presented his work on the heliocentric model, offering an alternative model to the widely accepted geocentric model. This was a major event in the history of science, making a pioneering contribution to the scientific revolution. Next in line was Johannes Kepler, one of the key scientific figures in the early 17th century. His work provided foundations for the Newton's theory of gravitation. He was also a contemporary of Galileo, by the way, and invented an improved version of the refracting telescope. So the refracting is the one which has a lens in it. In October 1604, he, among others, noticed a new evening star, a supernova, now known as the Kepler supernova, over here. But around this time, people still believe that the heavens, that is the sky, don't change, and Kepler's discovery wasn't in agreement with the religious body at the time. This used to be a major problem back in the day, science versus religion. The major contribution of Kepler was his laws of planetary motion, hence providing foundation to Newton's work on gravity. So these are three scientific laws, which describe the motion of planets around the sun. Using these laws, Kepler inferred that all the bodies in the solar system move in an elliptical orbit, where sun is at one of the focus. The second law implies that the planet closer to the sun, and as planet gets closer to the sun, it moves faster in its orbit. So it will cover this time, this um, distance faster than this one. And the third law states that the farther an object is from the sun, the longer its orbit will be. Considering that this was about uh, 400 years ago, this was pretty good stuff. The second half of the century brought us Sir Isaac Newton, who is credited as one of the most influential scientists of all time for laying down the foundations of classical mechanics. He published his research in 1687 in this book titled Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. In his book, Newton formulated the laws of motion and universal gravitation, which was then superseded by the theory of relativity by Einstein. He proved the Kepler's laws of motion that we saw in the previous slide, the trajectory of comets, and other physical phenomena using his theory of gravity. Newton also demonstrated that the motion of objects on Earth and the motion of objects of celestial bodies should be accounted for by the same principles. He also built the first reflecting telescope, by the way. Reflecting is the one which has a mirror in it, and published another book on optics in 1704. A lot of telescopes that we use today are sophisticated versions of the Newtonian reflectors. He contributed hugely to physics and astronomy, and we can have yet another lecture on such events. Though one point to keep in mind is that Newton believed that all interactions are instantaneous. So according to him, if the sun goes off right now, we'll know about it right at the moment. Newton's theory of gravity stayed untouched for about two centuries before Einstein came into picture in the early 20th century. Uh, I want to spend some time talking about his work. He developed the theory of relativity, which is one of the two pillars of modern physics, the other one being quantum mechanics. These theories extended the idea of Newton's Newtonian gravity to a much larger scale that we now study in astronomy. Einstein basically influenced all of the modern physics with his ideas and theories. He also received a Nobel Prize 
in the year 1921 for his services to theoretical physics and his discovery of the photoelectric effect, which led to the development of photoelectric. In 1905, he published a paper describing the physical phenomena in the absence of gravity, <clears throat> called the special theory of gravity. His work was heavily influenced by the work of Newton and uh, James Class and Clark Maxwell. Now, according to Newton, the velocities are relative, and Maxwell found that the speed of light is a constant regardless of who observes it. So no matter how fast you are moving, speed of light will be the same. It won't slow down for you, even if you are moving very fast. So if Newton's laws were truly universal, why is the speed of light an exception? Therefore, I, either the Newton's laws were incomplete or the speed of light was not a constant. Einstein, while postulating that the speed of light is indeed a constant for all observers, gave a little tweak to Newton's theory, suggesting that the time will slow down for a moving observer, which is called time dilation. That is, time is dependent upon velocity. Newton had said that time stays a constant and moves only in the forward direction. However, Einstein realized that time stretches and contracts uh, with varying velocity. Therefore, the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. And a little factor that does changes at all is this one called the Lorentz factor. Now there is one more interesting fact associated with time dilation, which is the twin paradox. The paradox was a result of special relativity, and the general relativity provided the solution to it. Unfortunately, I can't go much into the detail, but basically in this scenario, out of the two twins, which are the same age, of course, one stays on the Earth in an inertial frame, and the other one moves to the interstellar space for some adventure. And when they finally meet, the person on the Earth has aged more. So here is a photo from the movie Interstellar, and hopefully that will provide you a good example. Further, because of the malleability of time, because of how it stretches and contracts, Einstein said that together, space and time form a four-dimensional continuum called the space-time. We'll talk about this more later. Another famous equation that Einstein's theory of relativity provided is the E equals mc squared. I'm sure most of you have at least heard of it. The energy mass equals. So we can say that mass and energy are different units of the same underlying conserved physical quantity. All the energy that an object has in its rest frame contributes to its total mass. <clears throat> As an example, the fission of uranium-239, which is used in nuclear reactors and gives off a lot of energy, which was essentially stored in the atom. Another example is the mass of proton and electron individually is more than the mass of the hydrogen atom, where both of these entities are combined. This is because the rest mass, the rest of the mass, is used up as binding energy in the atom to keep both the particles in a confined space. Therefore, the total mass of any body also depends upon the kinetic and potential energy of its constituent particles, whatever the body is made up of. Remember that the potential energy can also be negative. Um, in much the same way, the sun loses about 4 billion kilograms per second because it's converting from one energy to another, making it shine. So you can think of mass as an indicator of the amount of energy. Ten years later, Einstein came up with yet another theory. This time, accounting for the gravity. The special theory, theory of relativity did not account for the gravity. This one, however, refines the idea of gravity provided by Newton and presents a generalization to the special theory of relativity. It began with the equivalence principle, which says that Accelerated motion is equivalent to being at rest in gravitational field. For example, in this GIF over here, consider this body, which has holes in it. It's leaking, and the water is pouring out of it downwards because the gravity is pulling on the water. Now, what Einstein says is that <clears throat> if I drop the bottle from above, like he's doing over here, it would be set in an accelerated motion, going towards the Earth with 9.8 meters per second squared, and therefore 
be equivalent to if it was sitting on at rest on the surface of the earth. Therefore, if the bottle is dropped from above, the water should not feel the gravity anymore and should stop pouring out. Now you can see that clearly in this JF. When he drops the bottle, it just stops pouring out as if it was there on the surface. Therefore, if you decide to be Spider-Man and try to fall off a building, you'll feel weightless. Although, please don't. <laughs> Einstein also proposed that his theory of relativity, uh, that space-time is curved. And its curvature is directly related to the energy and momentum of whatever matter and radiation are present. Now remember, matter and energy, they are sort of equivalent. Okay. So this relation is specified by the Einstein field equations where they basically try to explain gravity as the curvature of space-time. So the right-hand side of the equation, this one, um, this talks about the distribution of mass, energy, pressure, and momentum, etc. And the right-hand side tells you how all of these quantities bend space-time. The proof of this curvature due to a massive object was provided by Eddington in 1919 showing that the bending of light due to the gravity of sun that I am over here. So if the star was, star's real position was over there, due to the gravity of the sun, it would the light would actually bend. And we may see that the star is over there. So Eddington actually observed this whole thing. This effect is called as light bending. <laughs> um, in case the light is coming from a distant galaxy, passes by some massive object, the gravitational pull from the object can distort or bend the light. This is called gravitational lensing. And these are the arc-like structures over here that you can see. This is the light coming from a distant galaxy, which is bent due to this massive object over here. In terms of John Wheeler, sorry, in words of John Wheeler, space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to work. And if there are any disturbances in this curvature of space-time, they are called gravitational waves. As you can imagine, these waves must be produced by some accelerating mass or some kind of collision, for example. So the massive objects move around the space. For example, it's equals swirling around another massive object, thereby distorting the space-time much like water waves, as shown in this figure over here. Two compact objects, massive objects, uh, swirling around each other and therefore they're giving rise to these gravitational waves. The first indirect detection of gravitational waves was back in 1993 by the first Taylor pulsar. Um, it shows that the energy of the binary system, in the first Taylor pulsar by the way there are two pulsars going around each other much like this and therefore they are losing energy. The whole system is losing energy and it's uh, over time um, uh, they have lost the energy in the form of gravitational waves. Therefore, moving the binary objects closer. So you can see they are coming closer as they are losing the energy. And the observations match exactly with the results provided by general relativity. The blue line is the calculation as uh, considering the GR, the general relativity, and the red dots are the observation points. So you can see these are very precise. The direct detection of gravitational waves was made in 2016, about a hundred years after Einstein predicted their existence. Um, like this. So you can see that, uh, <clears throat> can you see the order over here? It's 10 raised to minus 21. So the distortion, the amount of distortion is very, very small, but even then we have been able to measure how these gravitational waves affect all of these things. It's a very interesting experiment. There's also an Indian initiative uh, in gravitational wave observations, or INDIGO. It's an initiative to set up advanced experimental facilities with appropriate theoretical and computational support for a multi-institutional Indian national project in gravitational wave astronomy. Now, another very interesting phenomenon that happens uh, in a gravitational wave field is gravitational time dilation depending upon how close or far one is from a gravitational source, the time will gravitate. 
slower or faster respectively as seen by an observer far away so in the movie interstellar uh ben cooper the protagonist and his crew goes to this planet close to the black hole due to the higher gravitational force of the black hole the time runs slower for them as compared to their partner who was still on the ship and age 23 years actually in this sense you can say you can say that your head is slightly older than your feet um just a few months after einstein published his general theory of relativity a german physicist and astronomer karl schwarzschild not marx found the first exact solution of the einstein's field equation for a special case giving the idea of schwarzschild radius the schwarzschild radius defines uh, the event horizon of a non rotating black hole please note that einstein himself denied the possibility of black holes so we'll talk about these objects more in a while now let me take a little detour and uh, move on to stellar evolution even though stars do not appear to change as human time scales they do evolve the key factor which decides how a star will evolve is its mass stars are formed due to gravitational collapse of molecular clouds for example these or our nebula uh, any other nebula as well from what we study where there is mass there is gravity so when there is some dense region forming in a molecular cloud like this one under certain specific circumstances a star can form either piece if the star thus formed is less than or equal to 8 times the mass of the sun it will follow this cycle over here and it will um the mass of the sun for your information is 2 million trillion trillion kilograms so if any star is at max 8 times as massive by the end of its life cycle it will explode into a planetary and the remnant is called a white dwarf uh, this will also be the fate of the sun the image over here is that of the white dwarf the white thing in the middle very small um uh, uh, around its planetary nebula this is called the schema nebula it's the green shell outside In the other case, if the star is heavier than eight times the sun's mass, it will follow this cycle. The explosion will be more massive, causing a supernova, leaving another remnant at the core, which will be a neutron star or a nominally high-mass star, or a black hole, or a very high-mass star. Initially, the star is saved from collapsing on itself because of all the reactions going on inside. so there is a balance between the energy going outwards through due to all of these reactions and the gravity trying to collapse the star now there is one important question that we must ask what is stopping the complete collapse at this stage here yeah. so um why is there a remnant at all why should, why didn't everything just collapse the answer is degeneracy pressure This is the pressure exerted by dense material consisting of fermions like um, electron, proton, neutron, etc. The Pauli exclusion principle disallows two identical half integer spin particles from simultaneously occupying the same quantum state. Big words, I know, but you get it. Basically, no two kind of fermions, electron, proton, neutron, can stay together, so they repel. The result is an emergent pressure against the compression uh, compression of matter into smaller volumes of space. In case of white box, over here is the is the electron degeneracy pressure that counters the gravity. That is, the electron will revolt against staying in the same space. Also, to mention is the Chandrasekhar limit, which says that the maximum mass of the white box star is 1.4 solar masses. For neutron star. the same thing is called the neutron degeneracy pressure in case the mass is already high enough that the electrons are spread loose and <clears throat> and it's up to the neutrons to continue their role therefore if the remnant is heavier than 1.4 solar mass it will collapse to form a neutron star in case of black holes we don't have any such limit yet we don't know how massive the remnant should be in order to form a black hole We still don't have an officially confirmed maximum mass limit for neutron stars. 
So theoretically, it's around three solar masses. Let's talk about neutron stars. The particle neutron was discovered in 1932 by James Jackman. Only two years later, Bob and Zwicky proposed the possibility of a star entirely made up of neutrons. Neutrons are neutron particles. These objects are extremely heavy and dense. Imagine a star at least 1.5 times as massive as the sun, yet only a few kilometers wide, like 10, 20 kilometers or something. The gravity of a neutron star is there for also a few months. If you were to somehow step on the surface of the neutron star, you will spread out on the surface like icing on the cake, but with a thickness of just one atom. This much of gravity is very close to that of the black hole, therefore another reason to study neutron stars. Neutron stars were also supposed to be rapidly rotating owing to the conservation of angular momentum with very, very high magnetic fields. Basically, these objects harbor extreme physics, very high density, very high magnetic fields, up to quadrillion times the Earth's magnetic field, and very high angular speeds. Neutron stars were finally discovered 33 years later by a graduate student called Jocelyn Bell as Boswell. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the small peaks in the data that you see over here on the charge border are the pulsar blips. She was credited with one of the most significant scientific achievements of the 20th century. A pulsar is nothing but a neutron star uh, whose magnetic axis, this one over here from which the jets are coming out, spans our line of sight, like this one in the GIA. Neutron stars emit very strong radiation from their magnetic poles. These are the magnetic poles. Uh, they seem to be pulsating. Look this over here. A pulse comes every now and then. And therefore, they were named pulsars, not as creator, I guess. So these pulsars give us a flip every once in a while, corresponding to the rotation period. A mixer grinder at home is rotating around uh, 200 times per second, roughly. The fastest known pulsar rotates about 716 times per second for such a big, heavy, and dense object. That is pretty fast. A very important point about pulsars is their rotation. Um, they vary quite a lot, by the way. Apart from being very fast, pulsars are also very accurate clocks. It means that every next blip comes after a very regular period. We have measured pulsar periods up to the 17th digit after this event. Now, if there is any change in the pulsar period, we'll be able to notice it right away. But the question is, what can cause a change in pulsar period? We know that the pulsar period changes extremely slowly over a period of time due to the intrinsic factors, and we account for them already. But what else? Well, what if there is a gravitational wave passing by the pulsar? That should change the pulsar behavior. Therefore, we use pulsars as gravitational wave detectors spread it all over the space. So IPTA, the International Pulsar Timing Array, is a multi-institutional, multi-telescope collaboration whose goal is to detect gravitational waves using an array of 30 pulsars. Also to notice is that there are multiple types of pulsars as well. There are pulsars which emit in radio waves, which I happen to study. There are ones which emit in X-rays and gamma rays. The mechanism for these are a little different, so we keep them in separate categories. Then there are magnetons. These are these have even higher magnetic fields than the typical neutron stars, about a hundred to a thousand times higher. We can use this diagram over here called the PP dot diagram to look at the different categories, as mentioned in the labels below. This is like a holy shrine for pulsar astronomers. Another different category of pulsars is binary pulsars. These are the ones with the part curve. It's not necessary that a pulsar is a single star. It can have an association. Uh, this partner can be another star, another pulsar, or a neutron star, a white rock, or even a black hole. These binary pulsars are a subclass of a category called X-ray binary. Now, X-ray binaries are really fascinating objects. These are, there are many theories regarding the formation of XRBs. 
The one mentioned here is what some people suggest. But generally, there are two partners. A primary star, which completes its life cycle and becomes a white dwarf, a neutral star, or a black dwarf, depending upon its mass, along with an explosion. If the secondary star somehow survives this explosion, these two objects will stay together. Now we can either have a white dwarf and a secondary star, or a neutral star and a secondary star, or a black hole and a secondary star. As the secondary star, this one, the yellow one, evolves and goes to the red giant phase, sometimes the compact object, as in the white dwarf, the black hole, or the neutral star, is at an appropriate distance such that it starts to eat the swallow star. This process is called accretion. As the secondary star further evolves, it can also happen that it forms a, a compact object too, as in it makes a black hole or a white dwarf or a neutron star within it, according to its mass. So this is how we get systems where a black hole is merging with another black hole. Or if there's a neutron star black hole collision giving rise to the gravitational waves, the kind that LIGO detected about four years ago. In some cases, if the compact object is a neutron star, these cases, and it is accreting matter, it may happen that after some time, it would have accreted so much matter that the neutron degeneracy may not be able to hold the mass. Therefore, in such cases, a black hole will be found at the center of the system. So there'll be a second explosion. That was quite much about neutron stars. On to the black holes now. Remember what I said about black holes. These are formed from very high mass of stars. Owing to the extremely high gravity, the escape velocity of a black hole exceeds the speed of light. Therefore, no kind of electromagnetic signal can come out of it, hence the black holes. By the way, escape velocity is the minimum speed required to escape from the gravitational influence of a massive body. For Earth, it's 11.2 kilometers per second. Um, historians Historically speaking, it wasn't until the 1960s that people got interested in black holes and thought that they may be real. But after the discovery of pulsars in 1967, people started thinking of them as possible astrophysical reality. Now, after about 50 years later, we have been able to get an image of one in another galaxy which is quite far away. Even though we are confident that there is a black hole at the center of our own galaxy as well, we don't have a photo of that yet. It is also not yet proven that all galaxies have a black hole at the center, but we think that nearly all large galaxies have a supermassive black hole at this point. Note that the supermassive black holes are different from the black holes formed when a high mass star explodes. The latter ones are called stellar mass black holes. These are generally the ones that we find in binary systems. The image that was taken by the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope, which is basically a collaboration of multiple telescopes around the globe, is of this galaxy, the center of this galaxy. It's called M87 or Messier 87. It is an elliptical galaxy, no arms like ours, basically a big ball of stars. And it's also an AGN, an active galactic group basically means that the black hole at the center of this galaxy is actively accreting matter, as in it's eating up. It's not always necessary that a black hole will be accreting matter. It only does so when the matter is at a certain proximity to the black hole. If it's too far, it can't, it can't pull it, right? So only about 1% of supermassive black holes have an accretion disk around them. When material from the disk falls towards the black hole, it gets heated up and shines even brighter than the host galaxy. And only one in 10 of these active black holes produce jets that fire particles at 99.995% the speed of light towards us. We think that accretion disk produces the jets, but we don't really know how. So usually people say that when the black hole gets more than its share of food, it blurts out the rest in the form of jets. M87 is the galaxy in this photo, and the blue thing coming out of it, the one over here, is the jet that is coming out from the center of this galaxy. And this one below is the photo of the black hole at the center, which is accreting, and therefore there is this secretion. 
when it comes to observing astronomical objects, we don't usually go with your, our backyard telescopes. Apart from EST, uh, which was used to image the black hole, there are a lot more telescopes that the astronomers use. And we are not just limited to the optical wave band. Um, we study universe in all possible ways, from gamma ray all the way up to radio frequencies. Some of these telescopes are on the ground, while many others are in the space. The Earth's atmosphere provides disturbance at most of the frequencies. Therefore, uh, we like to observe from space. India also has its name in the list with Astrosat observing in X-ray and ultraviolet band and the GMRT at radio frequencies. And we have many more than just these two. For my purpose, I'm currently involved with GMRT, the Giant Major Wave Radio Telescope in Pune and MWA the Murchison White Meteor in Australia. The GMRT has a mesh design for its, its antennas, very clever one indeed. There are 30 such 45 meter dishes which make up the whole GMRT array. They cover an area equal to a 28 kilometer diameter single dish. The MWA on the other hand is uh, made up of several dipole antennas and work in a slightly different manner. So, for my research, I use these telescopes to study the emission mechanism in radio clusters. I hope you see from here how much we need engineers. Science is just one aspect of astronomy, and the other one includes engineering and data science. The impeccable designs of these telescopes and the receiver system are a masterpiece of engineering. Also, with this many telescopes, the amount of data we get is also very large, and with that, we enter into the dream of big data. We are heavily relied on computer science for our research. Heavy coding, machine learning, neural networks, etc. you name it. And we are now using them on almost a daily basis to produce the data that we obtain. At this point, it might seem like we have found out quite a lot about the universe, but it's not the case. Here are some open questions. There are tons more, I promise you. Well, we still don't know how exactly the start is, this is or planet. Why is there a blast when everything is actually collapsing? Even though there are some theories related to this, we don't have a unanimous answer yet. We don't know much about black holes anyway, but what happens at the singularity? A singularity is a location in space time where the gravitation field of the body is predicted to become infinite by general relativity. The quantities such as the density of matter become infinite, that similarity, and the laws of normal space time break down. So, what happens there? We know that there are supernovas of black holes. We have imaged one. But how did they come to be? How were they formed so early in the universe? Past radio bursts, these, these are also something new that were discovered just in 2007. These are short lived bright radio signals coming from distant galaxies. But what causes them? Why do some FRBs repeat at unpredictable intervals, but most do not? Even though there are a lot of theories on the possible origin of FRBs, ranging from neutron star mergers to aliens, there is no concrete evidence of any. Then there is the exciting dark matter. But what is it? Is it particle? How does it behave? We don't know. Also, the, uh, the very interesting ones, do aliens exist? Where are they and why haven't we found them? And are we the most intelligent species in the whole universe? And there, or are there other beings? I mean, these are only a few questions that I could bring up today. What we know is a drop. What we don't know is an ocean. We are thinkers, explorers. Pioneers. We were born on this planet and we should rise above, explore what this infinite universe has to offer, and live our destiny. The modern humankind has been around for more than 200,000 years, from wondering about the heavens above to imaging the supermassive black hole in a galaxy 500 million trillion kilometers away. This was our journey. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much.
it was an amazing presentation ma'am we loved Thank it you. very Thank informative you. and very interactive thanks <laughs> and there are a lot of questions that have been asked in the comment in the comment section below so let's yeah, start let's see. okay so the first question is what is your opinion about the black hole in space would you provide some addition, uh, additional information about it okay um black holes are, are in space yes um they are in space see a black hole is uh, you can you can actually define it by just the swatch shell radius actually you can say that anything cannot come out of this radius and the whole entity is called a black hole so it's very we don't know how dense it is by the way but we know that uh, it's very gravitated so yeah so and we think that there are black holes at the center of the galaxy but uh, we don't have any idea uh, sorry we don't have any image of one at the center of our galaxy uh, the photo that i showed is of m87 and we definitely mm -hmm. know now that there is a black hole out there uh, there are no images of any other yeah and because it's of course you can understand that it's not possible to image the black hole if it is not a fleeting map right so yeah mm -hmm. So, ma'am, uh, I would like to ask that uh, what would be the difference uh, when a when a galaxy has the has a black hole on its center and when it doesn't? What is the difference? The difference. So, okay, yes, so for example, let's say um, let's say there are multiple different kinds of galaxies. First of all, there are elliptical yes, galaxies like M87. There is Andromeda and Milky Way. Which has arms, spiral arms. Spiral galaxy. And, yeah, and okay. there are um, the regular galaxies as well, which do not have a shape. They are mm. quite undefined. So I guess the irregular ones don't shouldn't have a. Well, they don't have a center, right? So I don't think there's a black hole at the center of them. But uh, and also there are multiple different kinds of galaxies. For example, have you heard of the large and the small Magellanic cloud? They are visible from the south pole, as in the southern hemisphere. So they are satellite galaxies, and I don't think that there is a black hole at the center of them. So I'm not sure about them. Okay. So it's basically okay. on how the stars and uh, the planets, the stars are always also guided by this gravitational force that is in between the center, the black hole that is present in between mm -hmm. the center. It's an assumption uh, on which we have based this theory that there might be a black hole at the center of every universe like is it right um, um i because yeah, i read it somewhere I mean, yeah actually that is the case see apart from just the black hole there are mm -hmm. other stars around that region as well they also have mass mm -hmm. so they also provide gravity so mm -hmm. the rest of the uh, stars right. which are further away are actually gravitating towards this whole combination so of things cool. yeah so there yes. are all sort of things going on yeah and also the um, we do know that there is a black hole, even if we don't have an image, because we have seen how stars move at the a very pattern center. pattern is being followed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is one of the, you know, really good uh, discoveries made by our scientists. Yes. That, yes. you know, finding yes. that there is a proper path in which the stars are moving, which mm -hmm. says a lot about what what is there at the center around which they're moving. Okay. okay. Uh, so, on the ne next question that we have is uh, what exactly happens when we go near a black hole? So, all right. So, like I and said, and uh, there, and they have uh, also said that answer in terms of time peaks. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> let me clarify one thing. I do not study black holes. I study neutron stars. So, my knowledge is limited in terms of black holes. Um. In any case, uh, black holes have really high gravity. Now, like what we studied, when we go very close to a gravitating body, the time slows down for us, as uh, as seen by the observer outside. All right, and our biological clocks will slow. Mm. Everything else will slow down, but we won't notice it. As compared to someone who is further away from the black hole, 
for them, the time changes differently. The time uh, is moving faster. And so, um, you know, the time, like the age difference that we can see in, in that movie, uh, the person who was up in the orbit, he aged more. He aged 23 years, while for others, it was barely two hours. This is actually quite real. Yeah, this, it happens. Um, uh, for example, we measured these things in uh, in our GPS systems, satellites. They right. observe a time dilation of uh, nanoseconds. It might seem small, but uh, if you don't correct for it, it is observable. Yeah, it, it becomes observable because, for example, if uh, if your GPS says that the petrol pump is uh, five eight five hundred kilometers away, by next day, right. if you don't correct for these time dilation, the difference would be five kilometers. It's, right. it's a big difference that can be there because of gravity. Uh, so on the next question that is, I recently read a information that black hole is releasing heat. As far as we know, a black hole absorb heat and everything in that case how can it liberate energy and heat oh, okay uh, the, um, yeah. Hmm. yeah okay so i don't i don't think i'm the best person to answer this um what i have heard mostly is about hawking radiation which is uh, which is the only thing that is escaping the black hole i don't know how it works so i don't think i should be answering this yeah <laughs> okay Okay, so the next question I can see over here, the concept you mentioned of interstellar space in which time can be stopped and move slowly, does it really exist or is it based on fiction? Um, it is real. Yeah, it happens. Yes, we have seen these things happening in the satellites above because they are further away from the Earth. The gravitational effect of the planet is less on them. And so for them, the uh, time is moving differently as compared to us. So, yeah, it does happen. It is not an, um, a perceived phenomenon. It is happening. Yeah. yeah. The m <laughs> biggest question <laughs> yeah, in, in everybody's to mind today. Scientist. Yeah, how to become a space scientist and work at ISRO and NASA? Uh, well, um, I can only say what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm doing a PhD merely in astronomy. I was already always drawn to the subject, and so I listened to what I wanted to do. And uh, here I am. And as far as jobs are concerned, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I, I'll i also do that and then let you know, maybe. OK. <laughs> how to process it? general theory of space, time, and gravity. Uh, I believe he is asking for a general brief on space, time, and gravity. So, oh. so, um, yeah. All right. Um, so I, for the title of this talk, at least, I purposefully kept it very wide because I cannot pinpoint what to tell exactly. I wanted to tell so many things. Space, at an, just the, everything around you, that's space. Time, something which is moving, now uh, moving in one direction. But uh, because of Einstein, we now know that uh, it's not moving at the same speed. It's moving differently mm -hmm. for different observers. That is one thing. Gravitation is one thing that sort of binds these two things. Gravity affects space time. It is and time as well, right? Gravity affects how time changes around it. And space is set because of gravity. So all these things are related. And Einstein's theory, I believe, has been a very most enlightening thing that has happened in this area, apart from this work, yes, respectfully. So yes, 
Maybe these things are related. And, and if you are really interested, please go and check out General Period Collective. But yeah, it's somehow it has succumbed. But yeah, it has somehow succumbed near the black hole. So we think, I guess we should move to the next question now. Uh huh, the photo of the black hole. Yes, so that galaxy, M87, is pointing its jet towards us. So we can, if we, if we actually look at the jet, you know, around that direction, we should be able to see what is at the center of it, at the center of the jet. Mm -hmm. And there is the black hole, the black hole that we see in that photo. And what is around is the photons coming from the matter that is about it is swirling around the black hole and is about to fall in. Actually, mm. it's quite complicated because, you know, um, gravity bends how photons will travel. So some mm. of these photons might actually be at the back of the, of the uh, black hole. But because of the gravitation effect, you are able to see them because they're coming. There. It looks like they're just coming towards you. So it's, okay. it's really um uh the gravity the way it changes the path of the photons is <clears throat> it's quite quite different quite odd okay. not odd different yes it, by the way these photons they don't travel in um in a straight line straight line um as defined by the euclidean geometry they travel in mm -hmm. straight line in terms of um you know the geometry uh, that Einstein said, uh, which is curved. Um, post, yeah. I did not have my part of geometry, so Einstein's geometry is a topic that has to be touched. <laughs> so I guess we should exactly. move on to the next question. And sure. uh, I'm sorry to say I would not be a part of this. Uh, I may I might break break down my internet connection might break down in between and it's embarrassing me continuously so I might get the video any time so moving on to the next question till the time we are here Divin, please yeah, this is an, this is a great question I think uh, how do you explain the of the universe and the mm -hmm. question of the cosmological constant that was introduced by the Einstein Oh my! It is, it is way beyond what I what I work in. Yeah, I'm, I'm apparently I'm not a cosmo cosmologist, but um, I don't remember if Einstein actually uh, agreed on the topic. Uh, you know, he actually didn't think that the cosmological constant should be there, even though his theory suggested that. And uh, actually, the the fact that the acceleration of the universe is positive is one mm -hmm. of the one of the, the 10 uh, you know most uh, the best sort of discoveries in the past century so yeah i don't think i can provide an answer to this because i'm not a cosmologist i don't think i'm the best person to answer over here i might confuse people so, so how do you explain the hawking radiation from a black hole with respect to general theory of relativity? I don't think it's related mm. to general theory of relativity, first of all. Um, okay. Second thing, I haven't read much about the topic, and, and I'm sorry, I can't, I can't answer this. Sorry, yes. And I think most of the questions are asked about black hole only. Ah, about as long as that is not Hawking radiation, because I, I don't know, I can I cannot uh, describe much about the subject, yes. If uh, I just what about the... What about the expansion, uh, expanding theory of the universe? Um, well, um, so the expanding theory of the universe. Okay, so let's say um, we know that. Uh, our, I mean, we don't know exactly, but we theorize that there was an explosion long time ago, mm -hmm. which was called right. a Big Bang, and after that, the uh, things are going far away from each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, mm -hmm. and and the expansion of the universe was actually proved by some a person called Hubble, Edwin Hubble, in, yes. in 1924 or something. He said that uh, yeah, he he noticed uh, the speed at which all the other 
nebulous objects are going away from from us and then he said that yes the, the universe seems to be expanding uh, i called nebulous objects because um, up until 1925, people didn't know that there is anything else but the Milky Way. They thought the universe is, is Milky Way. And exactly. the concept that there are other galaxies came only like less than 100 years ago. Yeah. So he was the first person to prove this actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from a perspective of an engineering student, what are the ways one can enter? computational astrophysics physics uh, research in India and what are the prospects as compared to foreign universities? Okay, all right. So um, actually engineering is quite useful in astronomy. Like I said, it's it's also one aspect of it. Yeah, we, we need engineers, really we do. Um, but for computational astrophysics, yes, I think um, there are many different universities in India that will provide that. Um, Irene Dor being one, uh, uh, Ayuka um, and NCRA and uh, I, I don't know, I, I can't name all of them right now. But yes, there are a lot of opportunities for, for which you can apply if you want to really go into computational astrophysics. And uh, as far as it is concerned about foreign universities, yes, there are quite a few, quite a few. And uh, you should feel free to apply to all of these universities. If you really want to go into the field, go and do it. Okay. Uh, could you please explain the about the uh, superluminal, superluminal. Mo superluminal motion of jets in M87? Okay. So, um, let me just recall it from my memory. Um, superluminal motion is when something seems to be faster than uh, seems to have uh, to, to possess a faster speed as compared to what we are seeing. Uh, sorry, as compared to what the reality is. So okay. uh, usually, not usually, um, in case of M87, the jet is pointed towards us. And uh, mm. therefore, we think that the speed of the jet is higher than even the speed of light. But it's an apparent effect. It's not a mm -hmm. real effect that is happening. Yeah, it is just because of how things are directed towards us. If it were moving in some different direction, probably we would have not seen it as fast. Yeah. So it is an apparent mm -hmm. effect. Uh, so ma'am, I would want to ask, uh, what is superluminal motion in, in definition? What is superluminal um, motion? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> okay, so it basically, uh, okay, I, I, I think I can better give you an example, which is just that if something is coming towards you at a really high speed, so mm -hmm. you're saying something comparable to the speed of light, in that case, mm -hmm. the apparent speed, apparent speed is what we see, okay, that right. speed seems to be faster than the real speed of the object. In that case, we call that a superluminal motion. I don't think I, I'll be able to explain it much better. Uh, I'll recommend yeah. you, you uh, look at the books for this. Yeah, I, uh, I would like to ask if there's any actual example, not a hypothetical one like this one, uh, coming at the speed of light, but... Uh, no, no, no. Is actually, any jets actual... are coming at the speed of light. No, no not jets, but... Okay, uh, I got it. Okay. So those jets are like 99.99% the speed of light. So are actually. Which is equal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, the next question. Uh, a person is saying, I have been always fascinated to see space through the telescope. Does the laboratories that you have mentioned in the last slides uh, Slide. give the opportunities to visit and open to collaboration and allow students to come okay um uh yes collaborations do happen i don't know if they personally allow people to come or not uh, gmrt does have a you know students day or science day where you can go and they'll explain things to you so at least gmrt does um i have no idea about the others but 
Yeah, yeah, but GMRT works in radio frequencies. So you won't be able, the world looks completely different in radio frequencies. Radio frequencies is like, a, um, say 21 centimeter is radio frequency. The optical right. one that you see, it's like 500 nanometers. Yeah, 500 nanometers. So mm -hmm. it's a huge difference. The radio sky is very different from the optical sky. Things look entirely different. Okay. So I'm moving. To, yeah. Next question. Apart from the uh, machine swift, what are the other technologies that are available for the detection of black holes? Uh, currently, EHT um, is uh, doing this imaging of black holes. <clears throat> but other than that, actually, we should be able to see a black hole when it's accreting. So. Um, when the accretion is happening, usually the signatures are in X-rays. So we look at X-ray data and stuff like that. So um, for X-rays, we have Estrosat, we have Chandra, and uh, yeah, these are the two names that I remember at least. So using those uh, telescopes, we can actually look at the signatures of an accretion disk. But usually they're, mm, yeah. Uh, but for imaging of a black hole, I think ESG is working, and I think now they are working on imaging the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Okay, uh, so moving on to the next question. Uh, why is only image of black hole is blur? <laughs> okay. It's not like the quality of... Uh, as in the quality of uh, your images is like 360p or something. Um, I think the reason could be that it's very, very far. Like I said, it's 500 million trillion kilometers. A trillion is uh, ten, is nine zeros, million is uh, eight zeros, right? So five into 10 raised to 20 kilometers. That is how far it was. And uh, yeah, so I think that is the that is probably the reason. I, I don't think. Yeah. But even in that case, uh, even in any other case, the photons are coming at uh, their trajectory. So maybe we are not able to define the boundaries. OK, man. So photons that are, that are coming from the black hole, are they coming mm -hmm. from the black hole or the stars that are present near the black hole? Uh, no, no, no. Look, Photons that are coming are from the matter that is accreting the black hole. Accreting uh -huh. as in when the accreting. Okay. Accreting means when the uh, when the black hole is eating up a material. So okay. uh, you know, basically this is a black hole and mm -hmm. the matter will be spread out around this in a disc like shape. Mm -hmm. And right. it'll slowly enter into the black hole. So here in this in this whole process, there'll be a lot of friction happening because of which there will be photons you know things will get heated up and those exactly. are the signatures that we see in x-rays okay so why does black hole emit certain gases gases i don't think black hole emits any gases it cannot emit light it can't emit a particle okay as an engineer from the CS background, how can I pursue space science in the future? But, um, again, computer science is, is is really, really, really important. I think we are, we spend more time in front of computers than in front of telescopes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, your background will be much needed. See, there are, like I said, there is a huge amount of data that we, that we get. So I guess uh, uh, no, you were saying. Sorry. I was saying that the data that we get is is a really high amount. It, it goes to up to petabytes and even beyond that. So to reduce all of that data, we can't do that by hand anymore, right? People used to exactly. do that in uh, at early times, but not anymore. We hmm. to save time, we makes we make algorithms and stuff like that, mm -hmm. so that to make the whole process very efficient. Right. For that, people make, um, you know, 
uh, several softwares, uh, machine learning algorithms, and stuff like that. In that case, uh, so doing all of those things, they really do help us in uh, in reducing the data and find out the meaningful information. And also, uh, all of these things are useful when you are um, sending a satellite into orbit. Satellite mm -hmm. to observe data. For example, the Hubble Space Telescope. Yeah, it was. It is an optical telescope that was sent to space uh, a long time ago. So um, yeah, these sort of things is where your expertise will be required a lot. Well, I think engineering of any background is required in space science, right? Actually, astronomy is an amalgamation of all sciences and engineering. You name it, and it will be useful in astronomy. We use everything, yeah. So all the engineering is very helpful. Yeah. OK, so the next question. Scientists think that X-rays come from the boundaries of the boundary layer of the black hole. Is it true or a myth? Um, the boundary layer of the black hole, there is no boundary layer of the black hole. There is just one thing called an event horizon. Okay. Beyond anything beyond EM event horizon, we will not be able to see. It. And anything that is uh, before event horizon, if there is something happening over there, we will be able to see it. But I don't, uh, I don't think there is anything coming exactly from the from the layer of the black hole. It's just the matter outside which is getting heated up, and therefore it's radiating. Nothing about the black hole. Black nothing is coming out from the black hole. Okay. It's only the matter outside. Okay, so this guy has asked two questions. So what is the reason of precision of orbit of the planet around the star, like precision of the orbit of Mercury around the sun? Hmm. So the um, precision of orbits, I think that this, this should be somehow related to the initial formation of, uh, you know, of, of when planets were forming. As you may you know that the axis of all the planets is not the same. Uranus is at 90 degrees. Yeah. And uh, these things are different. So I guess that uh, it should be some somehow related to the the initial formation of the system. But I, I can't provide you a pinpoint answer. Yet. I don't know. The next question is, does mass equation occur in horizontal plane of the binary system? Uh, yes. Whenever there is equation happening, it will be it will only be in a plane like uh, place. And so, okay. for example, if this is a compact object, there will be a plane. The matter can't mm -hmm. just go in like this and envelop the black hole or, or whatever the compact object is. It will form a disk and slowly swirl around it and go inside. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Has black hole had any influence on our planet? Mm -hmm. so. um, there is no black hole in the closest vicinity, so I don't think there is any influence. Um, yeah. Okay. Next question. Moving on. Is cyclic nature of time true? I see its derivative from Hindu mythology, like world destroys and then it is recreated with the chain of events. Okay, I have no idea. I, I don't know what you're. Uh, okay, I guess if you're talking about mythology, <laughs> I don't know if science can prove mythology ever. Yeah, uh, there are. I guess he, I guess he's asking things. about uh, the uh, repetition of, like there is a repetition of after a several period of time. Yeah, I think I have also heard the same thing, but I don't think that there is anything like that. I, as a okay. scientist, I believe on proofs rather than yes, story written down. Exactly. So I can't provide an answer, basically. Hmm. Uh, when the when we te when the technology to reach the velocity of light, a uh, light, uh, can we go to the another star as it is millions of light years away? Um, first of all, the closest star that we have is just four light years away, so uh, not millions of light years. 
Um, okay. And also there is a habitable planet, by the way, uh, in close mm -hmm. proximity to that planet. Um, also, uh, even if a massive particle, you know, a particle with some mass is moving, it may never reach the velocity of light. This is some. This is also something. Yeah, we may be very close to the speed of okay. light, but not exactly there. And also, I don't know if technology can advance that much. I have no idea how will we do Until that. Until we are here. Let's try to go outside. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you're, you're talking about proximity century B planet, I guess. Yeah, the most habitable one. Yeah, that is the habitable one, and it's in close proximity as well. Yeah. As in, uh, yeah, compared to any It's other. an exoplanet, right? It's an exoplanet. Yes. Anything that is any other planet which is not part of our solar system is an exoplanet. Uh, so, uh, so proximity, uh, proximity century, uh, century is a red dwarf. I guess our sun is also a red dwarf, or it's a yellow uh, giant. No, uh, our sun is a yellow giant, and uh, okay. um, Proxima Centauri is actually a star, multiple star system. It's not a singular star. Okay. Uh, generally, stars are in pairs, two or three mm. or four, whatever. Our sun is not in a pair. We are just a singular star system, but uh, Proxima Century is a multiple star system. Yeah. So, uh, how does it affect uh, if a sun is, if our sun would have been in a pair, or if any star is in a pair, is in a system, and it has a planet revolving around it? Does it affect the planet in any um, case, in any circumstance? Mm -hmm. um, actually, it depends upon the orbit of the planet and, uh, you know, uh, around both of the systems. So um, it's not necessary that every exoplanet can uh, have habitable life, according to us, according to us. Yeah, okay. There'll be hydrocarbons, there'll be water, and that sort of stuff. It's not necessary that mm -hmm. every planet has that. Maybe it's too warm, maybe it's too cold. I don't know. So um, it will affect definitely if there are there is a multiple star system. but. Um, yeah, we'll just have to check if the temperature is just right. Okay. So the next question is, uh, how far is the nearest black hole from our solar system? Uh, okay. Um, definitely the supermassive black hole, if you're thinking about, then it should be the center of our galaxy, which is like 8 kiloparsec. Um, a parsec is 3.2 light years. So you can you can see around twenty five light years, twenty five thousand light years or something. Yeah. No, thousand light years. Okay. Yeah, so it might be that far. Um, I don't know how the closest stellar black hole. It must be one of those X-ray binary systems, you know, where a star, uh, sorry, a sun or not a, sun, a star or something like that is orbiting a black hole or something. Uh, I don't exactly have a number, but there should, if there is a stellar black hole, it should be in some X-ray binary. Only then okay. will it be noticed. How does the huge density in a neutron star affect the matter in it? And is there any, uh, is there some exotic phase of matter generated? So actually the neutron star is um, very, very dense, like I said, and the gravity is also huge. We haven't mm -hmm. been able to see inside the neutron star for obvious reasons, but we <laughs> there are various theories that there'll be a super fluid or stuff like that inside, or super conducting material. And you know the densities and in, inside the neutron star can go up to like ten raised to seventeen uh, kilograms per centimeter cube, per meter cube. Mm -hmm. So, which is even more than the atomic density. So mm, the inside the atoms, the things are, uh, sorry, nuclear density. In the, inside the nucleus, the protons and the neutrons are quite close to each other. It's, right. uh, the density is around 10 raised to 14 or 10 raised to 15, something like that. In case of a neutron star, the density goes even higher. So yes, there is some exotic phase of matter generated. And um, 
Yeah, there are theories related to it. Okay. Next question. Uh, also, a basic question like, uh, can we see through telescope in the morning and daylight? And daylight? Can we see? Um, or there any? Depends. Yeah. Actually, it depends upon which frequency you want to look into. If it is optical, probably you won't be able to see anything because the sun is too bright. But exactly. if you want to look in radio frequencies, for example. You might be able to see stuff, yes. Just not very close to the sun, but if you're like 10 degrees far away from the sun, you'll be able to see stuff, yes, because in radio, sun is not as bright. And uh, even for other cases, in, even for other um, wavelengths as well, you can see in the daylight, not from the optical bill. So uh, that's why we choose, uh, we chose uh, radio frequency because sun is not bright that bright. Uh, no, there any other reason? Um, actually, uh, what happens is that different astrophysical phenomena mm -hmm. are um, show behavior in different frequencies. For example, mm -hmm. if, it, if there is a very high magnetic field somewhere and the particles, is go particles are going around us, have you studied something called cyclotron? Mm -hmm. cyclotron. Yeah. So a relativistic version of that is synchrotron. So in case of synchrotron, the signatures are mostly in, in radio. So yeah, if you want to image that, you look for radio. If you want to see gamma rays, of course, you'll observe in gamma rays. For some objects, uh, some objects we see gamma ray bursts and stuff like that. And um, infrared also is one of uh, you know, the important indicators of uh, star forming systems. So if you want to see if there is a star forming region somewhere, we go for infrared. So, the reason for choosing multiple different frequencies for observing is that there are different phenomena that we'll be able to see at different frequencies. It's not necessary that we'll be able to see everything from optical. For example, x-rays. Um, if you want to see that if you have a broken bone or something, you can't see it through eyes. You go for an x-ray, right? That is how things work. Not, not everything is visible in optical. Okay. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, there's a question. Yeah. That person that has been asked, uh, is there any way to pursue astronomy after electronics and communication engineering? Um, I guess so. I see. I have no idea about what is in the syllabus of electronics and communications. But uh, if you think you can relate to any of the things that I've talked so far, or the data reduction, or the technical phase where we are making telescopes and stuff like that, or even the science part, I think you should be, a, you can be a part of it. OK. Yeah. yeah. It's mostly about what you want to study. If, if uh, you want to study something which, uh, uh, which is helpful over here, you, mm. you, you're your uh, expertise will be valued over here yeah. and you'll be a valued member of the community okay so i guess that answers me and the other person also and this is the end of the question round also thank you thank you for bearing with me <laughs> so i would like to thank everyone every attendee who attend this session and i would very much like to thank our Speaker, it's Parul Ma'am. Ma'am, it was a really, really great pleasure to have you here. A great, really a great session we had. A great session we had. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am. Bye. I would like everyone to share this video and subscribe to the YouTube channel of our IEEE MCU branch. Thank you.